We moved about two miles from here in Vancouver, uh, close to Central Park area. And there was a petition going around when we moved there in 1957 that they didn't want Hindus living there again. Or they didn't want Hindus living there at all. This is 1957. My mom had just been through this fight in 1946. And she says, here we go again. Because they think we're gonna drag down the property values. Well, my dad was a gardener. He made our house and our garden and our rose bushes and the lawn better than any of the other neighbors. And they knew it. They still, some of them wouldn't talk to us. They wouldn't wave to us. My father was a logger and there were two trees that were bothering my mom. She said, those two trees are going to fall down. The wind's going to knock them over. So she got my dad to go up and limb the trees and chop them down. So one day all the neighbors that didn't want us in their neighborhood, four of them, five of them were across the street from the house and they watched my father start limbing the trees. He didn't have a chainsaw, he had a double bitted ax and he was pretty strong. So he climbed the trees, started limbing them. And our job was to, as the branches would drop, if they were small, that we had to help my mom move them. Uh, neighbors across the street who didn't want us in their neighborhood had a really interesting uh, scene here. They, they, there's a father up on the tree, here's the kids moving the branches. Here's the mom uh, who would go off and pull the branches off the roadway as a car would come by. And some of the branches are getting bigger. So my mom says, you kids go sit on the side, on the stairs, watch from there, and I'll move the branches myself. Well, some of the other men started helping her because the branches are getting bigger and heavier. So a couple of them came and started helping as well, moved the branches off to the side of the street. Two or three of the men, it wasn't their job, but the other guys, they started helping her. So that's when things started changing. They, they saw that they were hardworking people and it was uh, something that we kids didn't understand. But we saw it and we remember it. Going back to the long period of uh, over a hundred years of people being um, silenced, really, told you can't have the vote, you can't be treated as equal citizens in this country, being refused entry to Canada, like the situation of Komagata Maru. You know, after all of this hundred years of being told, be quiet, be quiet, you don't have a valid voice, then it's very hard when you start asking the community, hey, please come forward and tell us your story. People are quiet, they're silenced, they're afraid. It's so important that we tell the personal stories. It's easy to tell the big stories, but it's through the personal stories that we truly get the accounts that everyone can relate to. Who doesn't relate to the story of a mother or a son or poverty or starvation? Certainly in the 1950s, I recall the first time I ever saw a uh, bearded, turbaned Sikh, and I think I was maybe five years old, and questioning my mother, I said, who is that and what is that and what's that all about, right? And that's when she first started to talk about who these people were. And she did know that they, in her opinion, they saved her life and they were kind to her when they didn't need to be. My mother lived in the Dutch East Indies, which was a Dutch colony, it's now called Indonesia, that was invaded by the Japanese. All the Dutch troops that were defending it and some Australians were either killed or incarcerated in prison camps in other parts of the world. My mother spent, uh, I think, four years in a Jap Japanese concentration camp. The Japanese incarcerated in concentration camps all Dutch women and also people of mixed heritage. Uh, Indo-European people, Dutch Indonesian people, and my mother was one of those. So she would have been probably about 10 or 11 when she was first put in the camp, and she was maybe 14 or 15 when she was liberated. Now, when the war ended, in, uh, when the atomic bombs were dropped on uh, Nagasaki and on Hiroshima, um, nothing happened in the Dutch East Indies. There, there was no invasion there, nobody, nobody liberated it by force. But uh, these people were stuck in camps under Japanese, uh, 
uh, under the Japanese, under conditions which were really quite horrible. Um, starvation, malnutrition, disease, uh, physical abuse, uh, murder, random killings, torture, rape, um, all without consequence. By the time that uh, the war ended, I remember my mother telling me that they were close to death because the war was over, the Japanese had surrendered, but nobody was there to take responsibility for the camps. There was no Allied troops. They would have died within weeks or months because the Japanese, although they had surrendered, they hadn't turned over the, uh, the running of the camps to anybody because there's nobody to turn it over to. So uh, the conditions got worse in terms of food and health and, and disease. Uh, she told me in retrospect that she, they probably wouldn't have lasted another number of weeks, but they, they were finally freed by uh, Sikh troops. And so the British brought in the troops that they had, which were uh, divisions of Indian troops. And I recall her talking to me about the impression that these Sikh troops had made on her when she first saw them as a young girl after four years of deprivation. She found them quite frightening initially because she'd never seen anything like them. They were impossibly tall to her eyes uh, with her big beards and their big turbans. I'm kind of paraphrasing her exact words on this. But she went on to tell me that uh, very quickly they learned that these uh, Indian soldiers were very, 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 very kind. Uh, she talked about how they uh, were aghast at the conditions that anybody would keep women and children in those conditions and would, uh, would subject them to those conditions. They, did, they went beyond what they had to do to take care of people. She talks about the individual javans, the individual soldiers, sharing their personal rations with them. Their medical, their medical teams, with the help of other soldiers, taking care of, uh, of infections and sores and doing those sorts of things. Because of her wartime experiences, I think she spent most of her life frightened of most things uh, during those formative years, but uh, she was quite fierce when she needed to be, when she spoke about something that she really cared about, and she was quite fierce when she had to defend <laughs> South Asian people. And, uh, and it was at times like that that stories like that would come up. My mother went through a lot of hardship in Kelowna. She went through a lot of hardship uh, in Vancouver. She had six children, six of us, she brought us up. She also brought up her younger brothers and sisters in Kelowna. Only went to school uh, to grade seven. Father passed away in 1942, so she had to look after the children, look after the farm. Basically, she had to look after the orchard. And that responsibility took a lot of her strength. But she was a strong woman. She made sure we got a good education. When we moved into the city here in Vancouver, went to good schools, lived in the Killarney area, grew up in South Vancouver. And behind me you can see, is it worth it? My mom's hard work, well, there's degrees on the wall. That's probably the proof for my family and probably the proof for many immigrant families is to have degrees on the wall. But it was a very painful time and when I wrote this history of the Sikh people and I asked my mom um, questions about um, the struggles they went through in Kelowna and um, the hardships that she faced. She said that she would, didn't want to bring it up. She didn't want to talk about it. And she said it with a look that Indian women have that don't keep asking me, don't ask me again. I've said it, that I'm not gonna talk about it because it's, it was painful and if I have to talk about it, it's gonna bring pain to you and I don't want that. If I had to go through the pain, she says, that's part of what motherhood is. It's part of being a warrior. So she went through the pain so we wouldn't have to. <laughs> 